Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jeff. Again, Scott Foote. I've been in the information security space uh, since about 88. Um, that date means something to people who are practicing then, but it's not relevant to most of us. I can see Joel Jacobs already laughing about it. He remembers it like it was yesterday. Um, now, about half of that time, I have been on the product side, um, building solutions, information security solutions. Um, back in the 80s, we couldn't give it away. Um, even in the 90s, we ramped up and it was a tough sale, but after the bubble burst out of the 90s into the 2000s, the threat actors really came out of the woodwork. And um, basically it became a very, very hot market. So I participated in some large companies and some small ones with a couple of successful exits. Uh, one was um, Open Vision through Veritas and eventually was sold to Symantec at a sizable sum. Um, since then did a series of startups and bumped into the government and they said, would you like to come work for us? I said, no. They said, hey, well, MITRE's working on this thing. How about you come and participate at MITRE and be the uh, architect of sorts of this solution? So I did that thinking it'd be a year, it wound up being 10. And that's where I met people like Joel. So now Joel and I have this practice where we do security consulting. Joel is spending as much time doing CIO consulting as we are doing the security consulting because as we engage with prospects, it's, it's inevitable they're all doing some type of dig digital transformation. Right. They're looking at their core business systems from the front office all the way through to the back office, even to things like HR. And they're typically concerned about that transformation. So they bring us in to have a look and chat with them about risk. What should they be doing to drive down risk? But as I said, it's inevitable. They start asking questions about, you know, how do we stabilize our CIO program, period? Some of them have CIOs, some don't. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But most of what I'll talk about tonight is going to be cybersecurity. So I threw slides together. There's about six of them. I'm not known for brevity. So we'll be here three and a half hours as I wander through these. I promise you, you're laughing. You think I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to be brief, but tell me to shut up if I'm going on too long. The point is I start with an assumption of, of little experience and knowledge, not knowing the audience. Um, so I apologize if some of this people are gonna say, you know, basically they already know they read about in the press, but let's dive into it. Um, I want to start by talking about the cybersecurity threat landscape. I think most people have some idea from the press of what the landscape looks like, but we're going to talk about risk engagements with clients where we ask them to focus on, no kidding, who do you think the threats are to your business by name? Some of them, it's going to be criminals. Some of it's going to be hacktivists, you know, people politically motivated. Others are going to be dealing with nation state actors. The point is you should think about the whole spectrum and target where the biggest implications are to your business. We'll talk about threat and vulnerability. We'll eventually get into the consequences, which help us define what are the risks you need to mitigate. You can't plug every hole. You can't deal with every vulnerability. Let's start with the things that present the most risk to your business. But looking at the threat actors, the three things that they target are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But I list them from bottom to top here because confidentiality is the most obvious one where people keep hearing about it. Jeff, if you want, I'll send you these slides. The availability piece, you're hearing more about it with ransomware now, but it's been there for quite a while. It's getting a lot worse. And integrity is the piece you never hear about. The reason why that's at the top is because I wanna close with it on this slide. You don't see it. Most people take it for granted that they can trust the environment they're working in. The bottom line is you can't. So if we talk just about the simple parties, the hacktivists, politically motivated, right? Think of uh, groups like Anonymous. They deal with a variety of different motivations. Probably the most obvious is something called doxing. If you haven't heard about it, ignore the term, but it basically means I'm gonna get onto your computer and I'm gonna take embarrassing information off from it and I'm going to embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask for money. I'm not gonna use it for leverage. I'm simply gonna embarrass you. Maybe I don't like the fact that you own a fur shop and I want to embarrass you publicly and, and you know, try to put you out of business. That one is pretty fundamental. And we've been seeing this since really since the 70s, but it became hot in the 80s with a variety of groups like the cult of the dead cow. The denial of service stuff happens all the time. When we see somebody like this is what anonymous does. When anonymous gets ticked off, by the way, that's a fragmented group of individuals all over the world. They are hackers. Most of them are white hat hackers but they mobilize when someone pisses them off, usually politically or ideology based, they wind up taking their environment, just taking it offline through DDoS attacks. 
that's where they flood your website or your web facing uh, systems with traffic that you just don't want, right? It may look like normal traffic as it shows up, but it's traffic you just don't want. Probably a little bit more visible in the press are things like website defacements. You guys have all heard about it, but we don't, we just don't hear about it that much anymore. It doesn't make the press because it is so common. It hasn't stopped, it continues to happen. What's coming right now in terms of visibility is social sentiment and the fact that these folks are actually trying to continuously manipulate people's um, perceptions about the different ideologies. I'm not talking about pure politics yet. We're gonna get into this sophisticated, these sophisticated actors in a minute, but something called deep fakes. Have you guys been exposed to this? Have people heard about it? Basically where I can get like a video clip and put my face on the character. Chase Cunningham is someone in the space. I've worked with him back when he was wearing a uniform. He's now out, he was in forestry, he works for a vendor now, but Chase has been posting on LinkedIn a whole bunch of videos, Clint Eastwood films or Chuck Norris films where he has his face rendered. And to watch it, you would think Chase was in the film. The quality of the deep fake is very good. So it's experimental right now, but it's getting dangerous. And I'll talk to that when we move further through some of these other threat actors and when you start to look at what the consequences are. So let's look at the obvious criminals for the moment. Criminals, when they break your confidentiality, they have one purpose, they wanna make money. So it starts with fraud. We've all lost our credit card information. We've lost a lot of our personal information, right? People are defrauding all of us by taking out loans in our names when they steal our identities, but it gets worse. Companies deal with IP theft from their competitors, from nation states in a moment, we'll talk about that. They're reaping huge rewards from stealing intellectual property and monetizing it on the black market or just taking it to market and competing with you and beating you in a deal. The number of times that I have seen that happen with very large scale commercial industry in the US where the US company has been underbid in the 11th hour by a company from another country. The bottom line is all of the IP behind the US company's proposal was stolen and leveraged against them so that a more competitive bid could come out. The last one is extortion and we're seeing this a lot where people are attacking in the, the middle piece here, the availability with ransomware, they're getting in, they get access to your data, they will ransom it. They'll lock it up, ransom it, and say, you can't run your hospital without your computers, you gotta pay us X million dollars. But we've actually already got your data too. And since there's a lot of privacy data there, we're going to extort money from you. We're, we're going to dump this on the dark web if you don't pay us money to keep us from doing that. Now, why is that a problem? Because your company has to report they have had a data breach and with things like GDPR and other privacy laws coming on the books on, an, on a, almost a quarterly basis now, you could wind up being liable for significant amounts of fines, regulatory fines. We'll talk about consequences in more depth later. At the top of the criminal element are the folks that are not there for you to see them. They're there to manipulate your environment. They want you to keep trusting it so they don't take it away. Right? They're not announcing themselves, hey, I've got your stuff, I'm going to dox you or I'm going to you know, extort money from you. They're embedded into your infrastructure. So what are they doing there? You know, very simply speaking, domain squatting, I'm, I'm getting peppered on an hourly basis with new domain squatting. That's where somebody takes your domain and creates something that looks almost exactly like it in a character string. And they use it to try and basically they purport fraud and they pretend to be your company, whether it's an email and spoofing or websites or watering hole attacks. A lot of them are doing it for malware distribution. They're doing it because your domain is trusted and they want to use your domain to drive traffic to their malicious site. And that is like a watering hole that winds up being a distribution point for malware. And they're very good at creating these make-believe sites. Banking, banking industry has been dealing with this for over a decade and it's gotten really bad. But we also have this concept of executive you know, imperson, impersonation, and that started with audio, where fraudsters, criminal elements were out there taking recordings of your CEO, splicing it together now, and creating a very credible audio track that could be used to basically get money out of your company. So the CIO 
Joel, for example, somebody might have stolen his audio track, built the audio track, and called into a director of IT and said, hey, we got this vendor on the line. I need to close this deal tonight. I can't get you directly. Please approve this $1.5 million transfer to get this thing done as quickly as possible. I got to have it done by midnight. And by the way, I'm at dinner, so don't call me back. You won't be able to get me. That has become mainstream. It's not state of the art. It's state of the practice where criminals are to be able to impersonate you not just with deep fake video, but with audio. And I've probably got six or eight different examples of that happening just here in 2021 already where it's been announced. So this concept of the criminals getting money from you, they are very good at looking at how can they break your confidentiality? How can they damage your availability? But even better, how do they burrow into your environment and violate the integrity of your business relationships so that they can continue to harvest money? They'll do it and they'll do it low and slow so you don't catch them. Nation states are probably my favorite here. The first thing we all talk about is, well, espionage, right? We all watch the James Bond movies or you know, something maybe a little bit more recent like Jack Ryan. Those are very cool to watch. It's not far from reality to tell you the truth. There's no action, <laughs> but the technology is not far from reality. Surveillance is the main thing down here at the confidentiality level. So when a nation state is watching you, they're watching you because later they want to leverage you. They're trying to build leverage. One of the things we never talk about though is nation states that are not malicious, they're there actually trying to do good. Like the European Union introducing GDPR. Why do I put them on a slide that has a title threat in the threat landscape? Because believe it or not, holding you liable when you breach someone's privacy is a threat to your business. It's an incentive to the attacker. Now the attacker knows you have something to lose. I'm gonna go break into your company and I'm gonna steal any information you have about European Union citizens. And then I'm gonna extort money from you. This is happening on a scale of hundreds of millions of dollars on a monthly basis where we're seeing not just the ransom but the extortion from sophisticated actors. I'm not talking about two guys in a garage. I'm talking about organized criminal syndicates. This is a significant problem and the regulation, I'm a privacy advocate, I have privacy certifications, I'm also a, a data protection officer. But the bottom line is, those regulations create threat to us as business owners because the adversary is further incented to attack us and extort our, our business. Destabilizing critical infrastructure. Okay, anybody hear about a little gas problem last week? All right, that, did you hear about that? Hey, sorry, we didn't mean to screw with your economy. We only wanted to extort money from this pipeline company. The fact is it did mess with the economy. So whether or not you believe what they said, whether or not you believe who is behind them, the bottom line is that from an availability perspective, nation state actors, they very well understand how to destabilize critical infrastructure and they've been doing it for a long time. We're seeing it more and more now as it's being reported but it has been going on for a while. The last piece here, and then I'll move on to the vulnerabilities these guys target, is the information operations. So nation states today, the same as you see ships, you know, basically, you know, steaming away from port, the way you see, you know, these great fighter jets sitting behind John there in his background, nation states have invested heavily, heavily in building cyber forces. You don't see much of any of it, you know, it's all very sensitive but it is happening and it's happening on a, every single minute of the day. Nation states are probing, attacking, looking for vulnerabilities, not just in technology, but across the board and not just in big companies either. They're looking for any open door that they can use to create leverage. We've seen that in SolarWinds, for example, and even what was happening with, with uh, Hafnium when they were attacking Microsoft Exchange servers last month. So we'll talk about the vulnerabilities and the consequences. But this one slide, what I want you to take away from it is these people are serious. It's not 1995 anymore. These people aren't, you know, hackers, white hat hackers that are just, you know, being precocious online. This is on the order of, you know, Japanese, you know, the Yakuza, for example, Russian Bratva, the Italian mafioso. These are organized criminals. And there's very, very little a lot of us can do about it when it's across international borders. So let's move on past the threat actors and let's talk about the types of things that they target. Some of this we've already touched on. 
I've basically tried to lay it out in the similar, you know, nine kind of box um, matrix as a way just to communicate the complexity in a simple manner. So from left to right, we're going to talk about low to medium and high in terms of seriousness. You could argue which whether we've got these in the right columns. What's more important though is who are they targeting? Most people think cyber attackers target only technology. That is not at all true. In fact, the number one vulnerability of companies is people. People and social engineering was involved in better than 85% of the successful compromises of businesses that were reported in 2020. It came down to people. So what are these vulnerabilities? At the bottom, we talk about bugs and issues, right? Vulnerabilities in software. If somebody was a startup, they rushed to market, cost pressures, they didn't do the testing, and basically they introduced a product that had bugs in it. We're never going to get to a point where software companies produce bug-free software. Adversaries know that, and they test the software faster than you can even acquire it yourself. They bring up all the patches for Microsoft Windows, they patch the boxes and they immediately start testing their attack frameworks against the production software. They're always gonna be ahead of us in terms of exposing the vulnerabilities. But the other thing that people don't think about much is the fact that these adversaries also know how to attack your processes. If you're a small company that doesn't have a lot of financial controls in terms of your processes, they'll know that. They will study the company, they'll do reconnaissance, figure out who is your controller, and they'll wait until the 11th hour, like five o'clock, you know, right before quitting, before going on Christmas holiday break, to actually try to exploit the person's weakness at the top. But the most important thing is they know the company doesn't have a mature process, so it doesn't have any controls or checks and balances built. And they will study this. I won't get into much more depth about that because the top piece is what we're most interested in. The fact that people themselves, most people are ignorant of, of security. This isn't what they do, right? Could they learn about it? Of course they could. Do they have time? Probably not. You know, and do they have the interest? Probably not. So we deal with security awareness training as almost you know, 101, going in and talking to a company, what are you doing to train your employees? to train them to know that they're going to be targeted. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. I'll tell you two out of three times my phone rings, it's fraudsters. They also use weak passwords, password one, two, three. I can't believe we're still talking about this. I've been over 30 years in this space and we're still talking about people using weak passwords, but it's a fact. They use single factor, password only. They'll do things like store it in their browser cache. If you're doing that, please, tonight, please get rid of your passwords out of your browser cache. Don't cache passwords in your browser. You know, talk to me later over beer about why, but please don't do it. The other thing about people is we're all, you know, most of us are naturally helpful. We get somebody on the phone, right? A woman on the phone, crying baby. I don't know if you've seen the videos from RSA. RSA conference has been going on this week. The videos of the fraudsters that will get somebody on the phone, work on social engineering, convince them that, you know, I'm really sorry my husband, Scott, isn't here. I got to get his, his credit cards been declined. He's on travel. The baby's crying. No, I don't have that. Hang on. Honey, I'm sorry, mama. Right? She puts on this whole act with a baby crying in the background, and she manages to exploit my account. She gets the bank to give sensitive information to her, which can be leveraged by the next person. And it's not a once and done. They build a whole attack pattern to get into it. It all comes down to the fact that people can be played. People have vulnerabilities. Let's talk about the medium level of things here, the rush to adopt. So I talked a little bit on the bottom in technology about vendors. One of the biggest problems that Joel and I have run into is the people that will basically deploy technology and not think about whether or not it's properly configured. The number of times that we've seen data breaches because, oh, you know, I dumped something in an S3, you know, uh, bucket up in Amazon, but they didn't configure it appropriately. And those things are being tapped. As soon as you got an S3 bucket up and online, the th thing is under attack. It's being probed. So the rapid adoption is almost as bad, frankly, I think it's worse than the fact these companies keep rolling out technology that's full of vulnerabilities. We don't stop to think about it. We don't do a risk assessment. Whether it's web apps or the email servers that, you know, where Hafnium was the big one just a couple of weeks ago, desktops in general, and phones and tablets are one of the worst things in terms of us having any level of, of um, discipline in terms of what we put on our phones. The number of things that just my four kids now, they're all adults, but the things that they have downloaded to their phones that carry with it malware, and I can see it leaving their network 
uh, from my house when they come to visit. I'm like, you just, you can't educate people enough about the risk in the space. At the process level, in this place, we have, now we're talking about medium level you know, vulnerabilities. Here we have processes, but the controls aren't in place. So we don't have a second person making sure that Joel really did call and ask for that wire transfer. There's no secondary check in that space. The last piece about people here isn't now ignorance, it's their negligence. They were just in a hurry or missed delivery. We've had a couple of different clients that have just had on the lower level risks, they've had um, some of their junior people that have just started wind up sending confidential information to the wrong client. That happens all the time in business when these young folks are new, eager to please. They're trying to you know, show their boss that they're being responsive. It's 11 o'clock at night. They've been up for 16 hours working on this proposal and they sent it to the wrong Scott. Now we've got a breach. We have a breach of contract in place. Blind trust and, and naive arrogance. There are a lot of people that think they just can't be fooled. All of the security awareness training we talk about gets into this in some depth. So let me keep going through this so we can move on to the consequences. Bottom right here, complexity obfuscates dependencies. A good friend of mine, Dan Gear, he's been in the space for a long time. If you're a security person, you would definitely know him. He's like the grandfather in our whole industry. Dan says this all the time, complexity obscures your dependencies. And when you don't know what your dependencies are, you're vulnerable. If you don't have any idea what your dependencies are in your infrastructure, and I'm studying it as an adversary, I know exactly where to play Jenga with you. I know exactly which one of those things I can take out to produce the effect. Availability, obvious, but confidentiality and integrity are important as well. Most of us don't know anymore. Software and systems have become so complex, we don't even know where the computers sit. It's hosted in someone's cloud. Well, whose cloud? We have three different cloud providers. The lack of an impact analysis here has significant impact, not so much to small businesses, but definitely to the medium and large companies. And the folks from the MSPs will know this because they, their clients get into trouble all the time. And the MSPs will see a particular system and ask the client, what does that computer do? I can't tell by its name. In the domain name, internal, right, the IP, I can't tell what it does. And a lot of times the client won't be able to tell them. You'll have to go through three levels of conversation before you figure out that that is a critical asset to the business. In the process space, nothing drives me nuts more as a security officer than people who willingly take shortcuts. So in the software space, agile programming, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for the discipline of agile. But most of the people I meet that say, oh, we're doing agile, okay, show me, watch me. I'm gonna half ass my way through producing this software. No tests, no checks, right? No design. It's just boom, boom, boom. Like, wait a minute, you're automating chaos. You're not automating discipline in your CI CD pipeline. You're automating chaos. You're producing vulnerabilities to your company. That's exactly what happened to Solar Winds, by the way. They had somebody in their pipeline, not that they were half assing the whole pipeline, but they had one individual that was capable of actually publishing a critical credential into the public environment, and there was no process to check to see someone had done this. There was nobody following up on it. And that created a global compromise in IT infrastructure. The last piece is ignoring people who just ignore their obligations. Willful ignorance is the legal term. I don't wanna tell you the number of times that a lawyer has asked me about this. Oh, what do you think as an expert witness, would you describe this as willful ignorance? Did they actually stick their head in the ground? And the last piece, which hopefully none of us ever run into is the malicious insider. Could be a disgruntled employee, but it could also be a plant, could be a nation state or a criminal plant. That happens far more often than you're ever hearing about. But this is one of the most significant problems because they're trusted. The people themselves are trusted. We entrust them with the security of our business. Let's talk about what the threat vector actually looks like, what these guys do. This is not just a, hey, click on a you know, single link and it's once and done. No, somebody like me actually does reconnaissance on your business. And we've done this. I've done this with a couple of our clients on a large scale to show them just exactly what the adversary can find out. And one of the first visits, we'll sit down and show them and they'll look at us and say, how long have you been on our networks? How did you break in? We haven't even broken in. We're doing open source intelligence reconnaissance on their company. 
They gather that, then they look for the initial compromise. Who am I going to target? Am I going to fish or whale? I'm going after an individual. It's not always the individual that's most senior. It could be one of your administrators that's talking on Facebook about, yeah, I just managed to get our SAP, you know, rollout done. It's all buttoned up. That person has just told the criminal environment that they're an administrator and it, they're in charge of the financials application for their company. They're one of the first people we're going to target as a red team going in. So we target them and we do it through a variety of means. One of the first things we'll do is we'll go on the dark web and find credentials that this guy has used before that have been stolen. By the way, check the dark web, go on, have I been pwned and check to see how many of your accounts are there. I'll bet you you'll find at least one. For most of it, it's like 35. We'll use those credentials and we will start to pray and spray, whether we're you know cracking the passwords or just doing dictionary attacks, we will use that to try and get into one of these guys' accounts and use that as a jumping off point. Once we've established a foothold with remote access, then we pull in something called a dropper, which starts to bring in more sophisticated malware. But it's not right away. We're gonna sit and watch to see if we've been caught first. If this doesn't happen in a split second, the way you see on television, we'll wait for days to see whether or not we've been discovered. When we're confident we haven't been, we establish back doors into the company. Then we start to escalate privileges. We'll go after your domain controllers or wherever somebody has passwords with Mimikatz, we'll dump all of that. Suddenly we've got everybody's credentials, not just yours, but all your administrators. Now we can escalate our privileges and we can start to move around your environment. We're doing internal recon, low and slow. We don't wanna set up any alarms, but we are checking out, are you a Linux shop, a Windows shop, are you Active Directory or not? Is everybody local in terms of their credentials? We're gonna do that investigation to, to determine what's next. How can I crack this and cook it to the best of my advantage here? When we do that, we're in in a cycle, right? We're doing lateral movement and we're also maintaining our presence. So we're continuing to install software on a variety of different systems. If you find me over there on that system, I'm gonna surrender it and give it up. But I've used completely different software to compromise three other systems to make sure that I can maintain the presence I established. Once I actually get a hold of the information I want, now I'm going to start to bake it. I'm going to do data staging. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to encrypt it. I'm going to find servers and do encrypted HTTP off the box. <laughs> Please you know, be watching for that because that's a very typical exfiltration mechanism. But I'm going to do it low and slow. I'm not going to copy a gigabyte of data. That'll set off network alarms. I'm going to bleed it off slowly. Then I'm going to decide what do I want to do with what I left behind? Do I encrypt it and you know, modify it or delete it on you so I can ransom you? What is the greatest advantage I can get from this? I've stolen the data, I can monetize it on the dark web, I can extort money from you, but I may wanna take you offline because that's a double hit. And now we're even talking about triple hits from these criminals. This is a job. This isn't something that people are doing like you see you know, the, the hoodie actors on, on TV. This is a job. There are people exactly like me that are paid to do some part of this. And this entire attack life cycle could involve 10, 20, 30 different people from five or six different parties in a distributed environment where none of us really know who each other are. This is business. It's no longer the stuff of sci-fi movies. This is a, a serious business and it's global. These are the three different points where you can affect the most results. The initial compromise can be prevented. Educate your end users, use multi-factor authentication. We're gonna talk about these as I exit here in a few minutes, but get the vulnerabilities up front and you'll get 80 to 90% of the potential compromise. Further down, you can watch. You can do a better job of watching internally, of monitoring and detecting anomalous behavior. No, they, you know, adversaries are not so silly as to leave obvious indicators, unless they're really Bush League, yeah, if you're finding them, it's because they're either not good at what they do or they want you to find them. In most cases, they're not being caught. There are traps we can put in place that help to mitigate vulnerabilities there. And the last point is, once I'm in, I'm behaving like an employee in your company, just a virtual employee. I'm moving all over the place, creating accounts for myself, setting stuff up in all of your business systems. This also can be detected with better administrative controls and with people checking things. These three red arrows are just indicators to say you can break the attack, you can break their business, and you don't have to be 
looking at every single bit stream going through your infrastructure, but some strategic investments can make it a heck of a lot harder than it is for them in most cases today. So let me move past that. Let's talk about some real consequences. This is an eye chart. I apologize. I try not to dump a whole bunch of text on, on slides, but this one is an inventory of things you've all heard about, probably you've heard about in the last, say, three to four months. The first is the confidentiality consequence. It's about privacy today. It's about the privacy regulations. If you want to see what people are paying in fines to the European Union, go to enforcementtracker.com. There are a thousand pound you know, fines to one individual in some you know, medical healthcare dentist office who wound up breaching, but there are also million pound fines, multi-million pound fines to the likes of you know, Facebook and you know, Google and others. They're huge. So many, we, it's just not even worth tracking anymore. I could send you a link on the you know, data breaches du jour that goes back over several decades and it's got great data visualizations to the size and the complexity of these data breaches, but it's getting overwhelming. The companies that are getting breached and it's all about getting money from those companies. It isn't just about dumping our credentials anymore because our credentials aren't worth squat compared to what the extortion fee is that they can charge the company it was stolen from. That one hit, 10 million, they're done. They don't have to do the onesie twosies on stolen credit cards. The next one is intellectual property. I mentioned this one already. It's espionage in general. It's, it's both commercial espionage, but it's also national espionage. We've been deporting. You must have seen this in the press. The US has been deporting foreign nationals from a variety of universities because they're finding they have connections with their nation states that they hadn't reported. And they're working on very sensitive intellectual property through these universities. We even have US citizens that have been arrested because they've been taking money in the form of grants. They're being paid to do research, but they're out briefing these foreign nationals without coordinating any of that through the US. Not as visible if you're not in the DOD space, but it's been a significant problem. It's never been more visible in the public press than it has been in the last year. But we also talk about companies that are ripe targets like professional services, law firms, CPA firms, consultancies. Why do they get targeted? It's because they have a bunch of sensitive information about 100 clients, 1,000 clients. Why go to 1,000 clients and hit them all one at a time if I can go to their banker or their lawyer and I can get all that sensitive data from one hit? That's happened a couple of times in the press. I, I'll list a few of those later on. And then I, I, don't know, I keep switching to a different window here. The average cost of these breaches, this comes out of IBM and Ponymon's report. If you want, look it up or, or just send me an email. I'll send you a link to the, to the download. 3.86 million globally in 2020. In the US, it was more than twice that. This is the average. This isn't the high end. This is the average. $8.64 million for a confidentiality data breach. And that includes fines that you're paying in the restoration of the environment, what you have to pay for credit checks for those of us whose data was lost. Significant problem and it's no longer just a nuisance, it's getting into the boardroom. Those costs are getting there. We'll talk about insurance in a minute. Availability, ransomware, how many times have you heard about that? It, uh, I guess it was last Friday, a week ago tomorrow, one of the um, hospital systems, not just a hospital, but the system in Ireland, the whole system, multiple different service locations, ransom. I still don't know whether that's been settled. They did get some things back online, but I haven't heard whether or not it's been settled. The week before that, we had Darkside attack the Colonial Pipeline. They wound up negotiating, I think it was 4.8 million was what was reported in the press that they wound up paying off. This is just in the last week or two. DDoS, as I said, that, you know, kind of, it's kind of the horsey ducky of cyber attacks. Like, oh, look at that, that's cute. You know, a fourth grader could do that. And the reality is a fourth grader could do this. But we've seen people realize that there are a billion, two billion and growing unprotected IoT devices. So think garage door openers, right? Something as simple as a thermostat. These things are vulnerable. Once you install them, they're never patched. They have access to the internet. Guess what? They get owned. Once they're owned, they can be used for a variety of things, but the most popular thing is to use them like a swarm of a billion mosquitoes in a DDoS attack. They all start sending packets or bouncing packets off from someone else, and they're aiming at your site to take you offline. 
we're talking now about th this was unthinkable when I first started dealing with DDoS attacks, but we're talking about volumes of 2.3 terabits per second. Your own home networks are only running at a gig per second. We're talking about a terabit of traffic per second. If I aim that at your home router, you would get no phones, you would get no television, and you would get no internet for as long as I could sustain that attack. What if I turn that on a company? And Joel and I have spoken with people who've been threatened with that, where they've been threatened in email by you know these nondescript actors saying, hey, you know what, I think I'm gonna take you offline. You look like you could not afford to lose an hour. I'm gonna take you offline next week unless you pay me 50 grand. That's happening more and more. The Belgian ISP is one that bit me last week because I spent time dealing with a lot of folks in Europe. The average cost of ransomware is on the rise. Right now, it's fairly low. We're only talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars on average. But the high end of that is in the tens of millions of what's being asked for. Almost all of these, these actors, they will negotiate. They're criminals, they're business people, they will negotiate. If it happens, get the right people involved. Start with going through here in the States, go through the FBI. If you've got insurance, you know, work with them to bring in an appropriate response firm. They will help you negotiate with the threat actor to try to drive down the payment. If you ask me personally, I will say never pay. Never, never, never pay a ransom. That's easy for me because I don't own your business. But if you have any way to avoid paying the ransom, avoid it. The third piece here is the integrity piece. This is the thing I lose most of my sleep over, and that is the fact that people trust computers and information, and they have no idea who owns the computer and who's been manipulating the information. Hafnium, a Chinese-based acting actor, um, at least notably that's what the attribution has been to, they wound up attacking Microsoft Exchange servers. They had four zero days that they began exploiting simultaneously, owning Exchange servers of tens of thousands of us they didn't take it offline. They just wanted to burrow in like a tick and live inside of the exchange server so they could bleed our confidentiality. They could read all of our email coming and going. I don't mean just you know from the time they get in moving forward. I mean like a business email compromise. They could sync your mailbox and they could pull all your email from as far back as you've maintained it in your mailbox. They can pull all of it and you don't even know it's going. The attack on the water department in down in Florida, remember that somebody attacked the, um, the, the SCADA system? They didn't successfully, they did change the, the mix ratio, mixing in lye into the water, right? To change the acidity of the water. They raised it up to a toxic level, but a human caught it. That water department had humans that checked their processes, they caught it before it actually did damage. FireEye, we've heard about that, where FireEye exposed what was going on with SolarWinds. SolarWinds, basically, they, their, their entire software environment got owned, and these actors just started inserting malware and sending it out. And most of us in the tech space, we trust SolarWinds. We run it as a privileged piece of software on computers. Once it got in, God only knows what it was doing after it got into our perimeter. And the Russian SVR has been embedded. We've all heard about this with the election nonsense going on. But I can tell you personally, this has been going on for years. Information operations, not just attacking people's mailboxes like John Podesta, but I mean going at all of us, not just Republicans or Democrats. Their target is to undermine democracy. This is not a secret. And they still do it. They still feed all of that information, just pollute the nonsense into social media. They don't care about who wins. All they care about is that people are fighting against each other. And sadly, we believe it. It's on social media, so we believe it. The costs here are just inordinate. We're talking about things on the order of millions of dollars. Solar winds alone is something on the order of 15 million. That's just to fix the mess inside. That's not the lawsuits that are gonna come down. They're probably gonna go out of business and their assets will be up for a fire sale. That's my prediction. These are very, very significant damages and risks to businesses when somebody manages to violate the integrity of their infrastructure. But the last piece here is one that we almost never think about. The increased scrutiny now, the number of, of clients, Joel and I are working with companies, medium, small, medium, but you know some large size as well, their clients are coming in and saying, you know, we have security questionnaires, we want you to have ISO 27000 and SOC 2 audits, independent certifications from third parties, because they are trusting you to be in their supply chain. 
you may have access to their information, you got to pay to play. There's much greater scrutiny now. Same with insurance companies. You used to be able to walk into an insurance company three years ago and get a cyber insurance policy for a million bucks very inexpensively, even a large scale corporation. This year, prices on policies are up over 50%. Somebody's walking into a brokerage firm and the brokerage firm is saying, yeah, let me get you some quotes. Those quotes are coming back. If they come back at all, they're coming back at over 50% increase over last year. And they come back with this lengthy questionnaire that says, oh yeah, by the way, I need your favorite prime number. I got to have your DNA. I need all this information that we've never asked for because we are underwriting your risk. And if you frankly don't have any discipline in your infrastructure, you're too high a risk. We're no longer going to write your policy. Oh, and by the way, we're also cutting your coverage. So we're going to make it hard for you to get the policy. You're going to pay a lot more money for it. And we're not going to pay out anywhere near what we've been paying in the past. That scrutiny is a significant consequence to our businesses. It slows down the cost of sales, slows down the cost of business, and increases a lot of liability for the business owners. So let's talk about the control landscape. When we talk about controls in general, there are preventative, detective, and corrective measures, and there are anything from physical, lock the door, to administrative, the processes I talked about, to technical, like why don't you use a second factor in your authentication. So let's start again at the lower left. Guards, gates, badges, locks, you know, dogs, secure areas, those are all obvious. Encryption. I'll bet you the vast majority of us on this call tonight do not have encryption on the hard drives of our computers. Why is that a problem? because anybody that's going to surveil you will steal your computer. Whether they steal it to keep it or steal it just to bleed all the data off the drive, it's quite easy to get. If you haven't encrypted the drive, anybody that gets physical access to that computer can get all the data that's on it. That's kind of a, a 101 we'll talk about in closing some of the basic things to do today or tomorrow. Policies and procedures, these are administrative things. Most of us don't have them. Those of us who write them, we put them in a cabinet and no one ever looks at them again, right? We ignore them. What about with our employees, the NDAs that they're under and the security awareness training that we're doing? These are not a heavy lift in terms of controls. Patch management and the principle of least privilege. When we, one of the first things we ask people, because Joel has dealt with this excessively in his experience, when we get into the company is, do your staff actually have admin rights on their laptops. And you can tell exactly how your relationship is gonna go in that first 30 seconds. If they say, absolutely, or you know what, we're trying to take it away from them, but they won't give it up. If they stare blankly at you, is, is that a problem? Would it be a problem if my users had admin access to their? Well, yeah, because if they're browsing with admin access, it takes a single click and their computer gets totally owned. Those are simple controls that could be in place today that are all preventative. And of course, authentication like multiple factors, turn it on, on all your accounts, LinkedIn accounts, Microsoft accounts, Facebook accounts, turn it on because it slows the adversary down. It doesn't ever prevent, you know, totally prevent, but it absolutely makes it a lot harder. All the infrastructure we're all familiar with, like the gateways and firewalls and proxies, we all trust implicitly. Most of those are Swiss cheese, by the way, to sophisticated actors. And the biggest problem for all of our accounts, for our customers, for our own businesses, the data loss prevention that happens. How do we recognize when data is bleeding out the electronic doors of our company? The vast majority of companies have no mechanism in place to do that, not a very effective one, unless they've got a good MSP. In the detective state, the basics in the physical space is always video surveillance. It's dirt cheap now to put video surveillance into an environment. When was the last time you went into a bank that didn't have video surveillance on the tellers when they're actually working on the computer? If you've got people that have very you know, advanced uh, privileged access to data, maybe you should put them in a secure area with some video surveillance. Or if I, I don't wanna get into uh, GPS in general, we all know it's possible to be tracked on our phones, our computers actually, we can turn it on, locate my computer. This is becoming very, very basic in the means of a, of a control, but it can also be used to exploit you. Heat sensors will, I don't wanna talk about, you know, what happens with that type of a threat. From an administrative point of view, auditing and threat hunting, most of us can't afford to do it. We don't have enough IT staff and they don't have the skills to stay on top of it. The best idea here is put it out to an MSP or an MSSP, outsource it, but do it. 
from an administrative control perspective, this is how you detect when the data is bleeding out the door. Job rotation and risk ID, when you're identifying what are your risks, what should you be looking for? These are things you probably have to go to an external firm to get done, and it's not something that's done you know, once and done, you're doing it on a repeat basis. Job rotation, by the way, is to catch people that are fraudulently exploiting their privileges, doing things that they shouldn't be. To the technical level, the audit trails, turning on all the, dete you know, the detective analytics, there's a lot of good players in that space, but my favorite is to actually leave interesting Easter eggs for adversaries. Whether you're throwing out a honeypot and a honey net, that was exciting when it, you know, 10 years ago when that wasn't all that common. Today, it's very, very common. You should do it. You should work with a company to set it up, to leave that out there, not just because you can catch the adversary and figure out what he's after, but because you waste his time. The most important thing about a honey net is that you're wasting a threat actor's time. If he's hunting around in your labyrinth in House of Mirrors, those are minutes he will never get back. I love the fact we can burn the bad guy's time in these honey nets. Canaries are tokens. These are things I dump in files all over the place. I'll put them on servers and you know, just bury them, burrow into different directories where you think an adversary might be looking. What are they? It's a tiny little script. You can put them in a variety of different files. Ask me offline. I'll point you to a couple of sites where you can figure out how to do this. But if those files are stolen, they phone home. If they were opened up on a system that has access to the internet, by the way, really good actors are not going to open them up on a system with access to the internet. But if they do, you can figure out immediately where the beacon is coming from. You basically get an email message that says, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm your data and I'm not in a place where I really ought to be. I do that all the time with the lower end folks I've taught high school and college kids to do this, but also small businesses. In the corrective space, the basics, if you go for your CISSP or some other security certification, I don't know why we still spend time in this space, but we talk about fire suppression, right? The physical things that are about correcting a problem in your data center space. Let's not, let's skip over all of that other than to say, keep your backups offline. Do backups, please but don't keep them on the same systems. Don't just copy the file to a different drive on the same computer, take it offline. Why? Because if I'm gonna ransom your computer, before I tell you I've got your data, I'm gonna actually go and encrypt all your backups too. If your backups are online and accessible, I will find them. And those are gonna be encrypted before I even get to your original data. Because I don't want you to be able to get back from backup. From an administrative perspective, you really should have your disaster recovery, your incident response, and your business continuity plans in place. They don't have to be sophisticated, but figure out how are you going to recover from disaster. Whether it's some natural disaster like a flood, whether it's, you know, what are you going to do with your office space and your data center if suddenly there's social unrest on the street? This happened to me last year. In the middle of doing incident response, the incident response company could not work with us for a day because the physical evidence was in a building they couldn't get into because out in front of the building, the police had sequestered the entire space. There was social unrest. It was a denial of service of the physical premise. This actually happens. Have these plans in place ahead of time. Don't wait until the horse has been stolen. And the last piece up here is the corrective actions at the technical level. Redirect traffic. If you pick it up, redirect it. You shouldn't shut it off. You should always listen. If you've got somebody that knows how to do incident forensics, they will be listening. They want to pick up what's actually being stolen so they can tell you what the impact has been. Lock down the accounts, isolate the processes, the systems, the networks. This is what we all do if we're doing incident response. But ultimately, it's going to come down to you're going to have to restore the system. I would say there are very, very rare circumstances where I wouldn't say to somebody, throw out the box and start over. Don't try to restore because it's probably been rootkitted. Who knows what's happened with the BIOS? Throw it out and start over in most cases. But these corrective actions, these are the place you don't want to get to. This is the place where your company is losing money by the minute while they're waiting for the IT guys to get the systems back up and running. All of that was the simplest set of controls. There are hundreds, thousands of controls. The sys controls, we used to call them the top 10 or whatever. Version eight was just released this week. The CIS, it doesn't matter. It's, a, it's an independent nonprofit organization. They publish annually their list of the top controls you should invest in. Without doing a risk analysis, just please do all these things. Most of them are on this page. These are the basics. 
Encrypt the drives, I've already said that, right? Policies and procedures and security training, these are cheap. These are easy to do now. Multi-factor authentication, use it. If you can use VMs and sandboxes like on a phone, use them. If you can get your users, when they're on a company system, don't let them browse from the company system. Give them a virtual machine and let them browse. Let them go off and you know look at eBay or you know post on Facebook via the virtual machine. If the virtual machine gets owned, it's much harder for the adversary to get off the VM to get onto the core infrastructure. And it isn't that expensive to start provisioning these VMs for quality of life to your staff. Believe me, it saves you a lot of stress. Video surveillance we've already talked about, separating the admin accounts, don't let your users have admin rights. If they do have admin rights, make them log out of their basic account to log into the administrative account before they add the software, then log back out and log back into the underprivileged account to do their basic day-to-day -day work. EDR software, this is basically, you know, Symantec, right? McAfee, Malwarebytes. Keep that on the endpoints, all the endpoints and keep it up to date. They're not perfect, they're not gonna stop everything, but it's a heck of a lot better than not having anything on the box. We've talked about the offline backups. Cyber insurance is a control. It's a restorative or corrective control and it's administrative. It's going to give you the funds that you're gonna be losing while your team is rebuilding that environment. MDR is like what you would get from an MSSP. They're managing the detection and response for you. And for small to medium-sized companies, you, can't, you just can't afford to keep staff on, motivated, and you can't pay them. There are so few people. Go to talk to one of these MDR providers. They're not cheap. They will negotiate, but you get what you pay for. It is worth it in terms of having professionals monitor your infrastructure, even if we're only talking about a couple of dozen machines. From a comprehensive perspective, if you were to call us, we would say, don't stop at the basics, right? We would say, put together a risk foundation, understand what your assets are, your technology assets, your information assets, the bleed, how many people are bringing things like Fitbits into your office and they're on your Wi-Fi, all of that, that set of assets, those are invisible. Understand what's in the cloud, but also understand your people, their assets as well. Look at the dependencies of your own company, do an impact analysis. It's not hard, it's tedious, it's frankly not very exciting, unless you're the bad guy who wants to crack this new fish you've just um, you've come across. Bad guys spend most of their time surveilling to map your dependencies and understand your obligations. What are your obligations, legal, contractual, and even just regulatory. When we do risk identification, we saw three slides, one on threats, one on vulnerabilities, and one on consequences. Think about it. Spend a couple of hours with your peers, whether they're in the company or people that you, that you, you know, socialize with after work. Even on an event like this, Jeff, you could have one night where pick one or two companies and put it together. I wouldn't put it out on Facebook, but talk about risk scenarios. Who are the likely threat actors that are going to come after your business? What are the vulnerabilities you have, not just in technology, but your processes and your people? What are the controls that you could look at from a decent cost benefit analysis point of view that aren't going to you know, basically cost you a million dollars, but they will help burn down the risk? Start by identifying these scenarios, these uh, vulnerability, threat, and consequence. Pair them in a triple, it becomes a scenario. By the way, your insurance company will love you if you start mapping that out. We've talked about each of these in depth already. Ultimately, you wanna to get to that risk management. You wanna make cost-effective decisions about what controls you're gonna invest in. Don't ever listen to somebody like me that comes in and says, just do these 10 things and you're secure. That's garbage. Think about it from a risk perspective. What is the highest risk to your business? Joel tells stories to our prospects about different roles he's been in in the past where he was worried about availability, yet his peer, he walked into a conversation with the peer expecting the peer's highest priority would be to protect availability of their data. When in fact, the peer said, no, you know what? We, <laughs> that's not an issue for us. We care about the integrity or confidentiality. Joel was probably worried about confidentiality and the peer might've been con concerned about availability because they were doing something mission critical. Don't just assume, actually think about the controls in terms of the risk to your business. What matters to your business? Ultimately, where we wanna to get to is trust. We're trying to build trust, not just with our customers, but in the whole supply chain. 
it's never going to be bulletproof. And anybody who comes thinking that you're going to be bulletproof, they're not a good customer. But they just want to know that you're being diligent. They want to know you're not being irresponsible with their information and putting their business at risk. In order to build trust, you need a more comprehensive strategy. A lot of us start on the technology side with just that left-hand column. What are my assets? And I'm talking routers and laptops and servers. Let's just lock it down vulnerabilities and put a bunch of controls on it. That's the IT mentality. But if you expand that to talk about what I just mentioned a minute ago, wait a minute, what are the risks? I can't spend all this money. I don't have this money in my budget. Let me map out the dependencies. Think about the, the actual threats. Are we gonna have criminal elements, nation state elements, hackers, activists? Who are the likely threats and what are the risks that we're trying to protect against? Let's start with the biggest one and burn them down. Ultimately, your sales force is gonna love you if you think about the obligations to those clients. What are the consequences, not just to you, but to them? to everyone in that supply chain and how can you build trust? It accelerates the sale if you step forward with transparency and I don't mean let them in and audit everything, but I mean things like third party certifications. Do what you need to to build the trust in that supply chain and you'll build a much tighter relationship. The four different elements that when we get involved, we typically will do an assessment, pick a standard ISO, NIST, there's a variety of different approaches, but we will do an assessment based upon that standard. Then we'll look at what is the strategy for this company? What are the risk scenarios we've identified? What do we think they should do in terms of burning down the vulnerabilities or gaps first? Not because they're the easiest to do, but because they impact the risk that we've identified. Ultimately, we wanna leave them with a program where they're governing. They're actually gonna do the work to maintain this program and they're gonna go out and get third party certifications and they will use that, not just as evidence to their insurance company, but to help build better trust in their prospects. That's obviously a big lift. Many companies don't have the money to do that. You don't have to spend millions to get it done, but believe me, it pays its dividends downstream. It is infinitely better to be working through this than to be trying to get your company back online for the second time in a year that it's been ransomed by different actors that keep coming in through the same open doors. So with that, let me shut up and just see whether or not there are questions or if I've bored you guys to sleep. Nobody's drinking beer yet, I'm disappointed to see. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll make it a requirement. So Scott, when you uh, talk about the importance of knowing what's in the environment, right? Like the server that nobody knows what, knows what it does. What are some of the ways that companies can, um, what, are, what are the tools out there that companies can use to, uh, to kind of get that asset management or inventory of their systems? So we can do asset management. We can do that technically, right? We can deploy things on the, on the environment that actually like Nessus and MNAP I use all the time to scan a network to identify the devices. But what I wanna know is what do they do? So I've done this on a very high end with something called the business impact analysis. Let's talk small business. What we do, what Joel and I and the other folks at Phenomenati have done is we have something called a DARE matrix. DARE, DARE stands for the data, application, infrastructure, and risk. Let's sit down with the company and say, who's the finance person? Who's the HR person? Who's the sales person? Who's, you know, what is your business? Manufacturing, delivery, right? Give me the core five, six, seven business units. What do you do? Tell me about the information you care about. In sales, it's all about, of course, all of the accounts. In, say, HR, it's going to be about all your employee records, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what apps do you use to manage those? Oh, you know, we're using ADP online or we're using, you know, whatever, PeopleSoft, blah, blah, blah. Okay, where is it? Is it deployed on-prem or is it in the cloud? We go through the systematic conversation with the business owner first. We're not asking them the name of the computer. What we're trying to do is get a sense for, do they have shadow IT? Has somebody gone around the IT department and basically outsourced everything to a third party SaaS provider? If it's internal, okay, what are these assets? Where is it all managed from? Do you have five offices in the US? Where's your data center? It's highly distributed. Where are the physical computers? Oh, actually we've just centralized them. We're using Rackspace or something like that. So we start at the top, Michael, and we work down. And in this DARE matrix, what we're doing is it's a simple Excel spreadsheet built left to right. Think of it as a hierarchy of the business. But what we're trying to do is what I would do if I were gonna attack the company, right? But instead of doing recon, we're gonna ask the company to start to declare that. 
Then we get down to what are the assets, and that's where we start mapping the physical assets to, okay, I get this. These two, that's the domain controller, primary, secondary. Over here, I've got a SharePoint server. There's no primary, secondary. That's an asset, but it could be at risk. Only then, though, do we talk about technology after we've mapped the business and its dependencies, and we try to do it as non-intrusively as possible. If you set it up as a big engagement, it's going to take 40 hours, et cetera, nobody's going to want to do it. But if you set it up as a drive-by couple of conversations over a beer, lunch, coffee, something like that, you can elicit so much of this information, give them back a map. And I would say without exception, the clients that we've done a Dare Matrix for, they have all said singularly, that's the most valuable thing you've done for us. Yeah. Mapping out all of our dependencies. And we, you know, we kind of laugh and say, well, we all we did was ask you the questions. You had the knowledge, you just don't have the discipline to capture it in a simple tool like a spreadsheet. And if they don't want to do that, just call us and you know we'll do reconnaissance on them and give it to them anyway. Right, but let's say let's say I'm an IT director someplace and and I know what my dependencies are. You know, I I, I have pretty good processes in place for uh, for you know to you know combat against um, things like um, uh, social engineering and such. And I just want to know like what's on my network. Like if somebody like plugs in something, I want to know what's there. What are some tools out there that, that people can use for that kind of thing? So I use Nessus and Nmap specifically to, Nmap will give you a map of your environment. Nessus is gonna help you fingerprint things and Wireshark. Wireshark is also very, very helpful. These are all open source tools, by the way. So, I mean, you can go to Tenable and get a you know fully supported version of something. The bottom line is the open source tools. If you go to the Phenomenati site, Michael, there's a resource center page, pull it down. You'll see about 20 different pages that list open source technologies that and with the links to the appropriate sites that allow you to do a lot of this, whether it's the internal sc uh, scanning or then afterwards establishing some monitoring and detection all the way through to the incident response. I keep an inventory of my favorite tools on that site. So phenomenality.com, the resource center on the right hand side, drop it down and you'll see tons and tons of links. But those are Thank my you. favorite, Nmap, Nessus, Wireshark. Thank you. Jeff, how are we doing on time? I know we're, we're over by probably five minutes or so. No, actually right on target. Now you're going to 7.15, we have a presentation and now it sounds like we're in Q&A. So good stuff, let's ask some good questions. I think any every IT director needs to see this presentation, to be honest with you. So actually me, every, every CEO of every company, see a, every C-level person needs to see this. Yeah, is this, do you, did we record this? Because I, uh, I kind of want to steal some of the content. It's really good. I, um, I, I'm going to probably stop the Zoom recording, but this is also getting streamed right now on the Mass Tech Networking Facebook page. Awesome. The whole, the whole thing is. Awesome. Um, and I heard room is Scott's going to share the slides too. The, the, the content is spot yeah. on, spot on. I had trouble. I was talking to my... I was muted, but I was talking to myself, uh, you know, so many different times saying like, yes, that is exactly what, you know, the people are the most, your most vulnerable, uh, the part of the organization and uh, so on and so forth. But um, yeah, everything was spot on on this. I'm impressed. Thanks, Thanks Samantha. So we actually do this for, for boards where we will go in for the executive team if they want to bring the board around or a board member who wants a subcommittee, we'll go in and we do an hour. It doesn't have quite as much of the technical depth, but it's a set of this content. These slides I built specifically for us tonight, but we will go in and do that as an engagement with the executive level. And we'll typically tag team myself and Joel, for example, Joel being the consummate CIO and he's been, you know, very humble and not explaining what his credentials are, but he's been CIO of the year. He's got more awards than I even knew existed in the space. Um, so he'll do that from the, the IT and the information perspective. And then I play the bad cop coming in the security guy where I say, no, no, you can't do that. No, we're not gonna enable these users, get the damn users off my computers, right? But the bottom line is we try to, we try to bring these concepts into the boardroom and the C team and make it decision quality information. We're not gonna, overwhelm them with technology or the latest you know exploit from some sophisticated actor we're simply going to explain to them your business is at risk there is a way for you to identify that risk and there's a way for you to begin to burn it down 
You'll never get rid of it, but let's not ignore it. No more willful ignorance. Let's use due diligence and due care. So let me ask Joel to chime in here. Yeah, I was going to add, add, add uh, uh, there's a, one of the challenges uh, uh, that companies face, especially small and medium businesses, is that they don't have the resources and they don't have the maturity of processes. And they haven't invested in even hiring a, a, a security director, let alone a CISO. They may not even have a, a sitting CIO either. And uh, their organization has grown, their IT organization has grown up uh, from mostly um, technicians and help desk and yeah. some engineers. Uh, when you when you have to upgun this uh, kind of environment, um, you have to ask yourself whether you have the ability even to attract and retain the right kinds of staff to take that on. Um, and how much of it should you be trying to do yourself? Is a small fraction of the of companies who uh, have both have the resources and capabilities to defend themselves thoroughly. So they have to decide where they should get uh, managed service help um, or other kinds of expertise uh, available to them uh, to def simply defend themselves. And as simple and, and as complicated as open source environments are, there, I mean, it's it's tough for these SMBs to employ a say an Ubuntu expert or a Linux expert. Right. Um, so that that's where we come in to help, right? Yeah. Um, and that's where boards have to understand what risks they're carrying. Um, based on the executives, the incumbent executives and the methods for uh, managing this as an enterprise risk challenge, not just as an IT challenge. Yeah, it's about seeing that, like you have to communicate the message of seeing a, a larger picture and an overall view of everything and how they interact and integrate with each application, each you know VM, whatever server, you know, any, process that you're working and it there's just a lot to it and it, it gets overwhelming i, I get it because yeah. stick it people get oh, oh well we can't take on that project that's uh that's that's too it's too much and um but it's about simplifying it for them and, I, and it's also it's also about making sure you're able to to learn how to manage and mitigate risk aligned to the business opportunity you don't want to leave business opportunities on the table simply because it sounds like there's some risk in it. And we don't have a way of evaluating that to determine whether uh, it's a risk we're, we're willing to accept. If there's a way to mitigate